A very good morning to you. Welcome to the Every Nation Dorado Congregation. And if this is your first time joining us, a very, very warm welcome to you. Let's take a look at some of the announcements for the upcoming weeks. Every Monday, we pray and fast corporately as a church. Join us for our prayer session live on Facebook at 6 p.m. on Monday. And on Friday, the 18th of September at 7 p.m., we will be having a special Friday evening message. Please make sure to diarize this date and not miss out. And on Sunday, the 20th of September, we will be having a special guest speaker all the way from every nation, Tswane in South Africa. Pastor Philip Pretorius will be preaching the message on Sunday, the 20th of September. And we invite you to donate to our We Care Ministry one or more of the following items that are on your screen. Please do bring these items to the church office during the weekdays. Cash donations are also welcome and can be deposited into the church account. Remember to reference We Care. During the week across the city, small groups of people meet in homes, coffee shops, university residents, and other convenient places, studying the Bible, challenging each other, building relationships, and just doing life together. This is what a Connect Group is. To join a Connect Group today, simply email connect at enventuk.org. You can still pay your tithe and offering by using any of the available platforms, Pay Today, PayPal's, or EFT. And to find out more about who we are as a church or to find the latest sermons, you can visit our website at www.envintook.org. Hello everyone and welcome once again to our online service. It's always a privilege to be able to come together around the Word of God in spite of everything that's happening. And um, it is my uh, awesome, wonderful privilege to be able to greet you by the power of the Holy Spirit, as we just come together as spiritual family, wherever you may be in your homes and wherever you're fellowshipping. Um, Once again, we're in a time where the COVID-19 numbers seem to be going completely out of control. And I wanna encourage us as a spiritual family and whoever may be watching, that you will not allow fear to grip your heart, that your heart will not fail for fear, but that you will know that the Lord your God is with you. And that despite whatever we may be going through, that he is able to keep us through it. And that's my encouragement, even as we're doing this series uh, on family and marriage. It is so important, especially the fathers and mothers, to keep that tone of faith in the home. Today is also our special uh, communion service, and it fits very much with our theme. I want to encourage you at the end of our message uh, to get together your elements of uh, bread and wine or bread and, and, and juice so that you're, you're able to participate as a family or wherever you're fellowshipping, that we will uh, share the word of God and uh, have some communion at the end of the message. So we're, we're continuing with the second installment of our series on marriage and family, and this is just a two-part series to refresh us. Last week, we spoke about marriage, and I want to encourage you to go back to that message. If you haven't seen it, you will be blessed because of the focus and the foundation that it builds for today's message. And uh, today, we'll be speaking about children and parenting, the, the value of children in our communities and in our families. And so before we get into the message, I just want to pray for us. Father, I thank you, Lord, that... Today is the day that you have made, and we are rejoicing therein. I thank you, God, that wherever we may be, that your word is able to reach us and encourage us and build us up. And today I pray, God, that your word will be alive in our hearts, that we'll be encouraged to follow your word and to reap the blessing and the benefit out of it. Speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. So last week... We spoke about marriage and we touched on the fact that marriage is for male and female, one male and one female. We spoke about how marriage is designed as the center 
of our society. We spoke about how marriage is a parable between Christ and his bride, and we spoke about how marriage is a foundation for children. And one thing that I just want to encourage all married couples, and even those who are single who are thinking about marriage, it is important that you focus on oneness. If you're married right now, this should be your value, that you and your husband, your husband and your wife, husband and wife, that you are focused on oneness and unity. The Word of God says that a kingdom divide, divided against itself or a house divided against itself cannot stand, and it will take so much of our attention away from marriage if we don't have that unity. And Christ is the one that becomes the key foundation of our unity. And so if, if you're not born again, we want to encourage you to make that commitment today as we go through this message. So today we're talking about parenting and children. And if you, if you consider what's happening around the world, we're right now seeing a, a, a lot of messages trending around the world about how uh, child abuse is being exposed all over the world. And there are so many syndicates that have been trafficking children and taking advantage of the vulnerabilities that children have. And many times it's as a result of the fact that they don't seem to have high value in our societies or they don't have the protection that they deserve. And you might say, no, in our society, in our communities, we value children. If you are a community or a society that aborts children, then what is the question that you need to answer? You need to realize that if you're able as a society to abort children, then surely what happens to them when they're born will not have much of a value and will not have much protection from you. There's sometimes so much of a contradiction between the values of our society. But today, I want to emphasize this. I want to really encourage us to realize that children are valuable. We're going to go through the following four points today. Understand, first, understand, we must understand that children are a blessing and a gift, not a burden or an inconvenience. They are a blessing and a gift. Number two, children have a purpose. God's order, God's design, children have a purpose, and we'll go through that. Number three, child abuse starts with family abuse. And it is important that we as families take accountability for what's happening to children around us, but it begins with us respecting God's design and order for family before we bring children into that equation. And then number four, children should obey their parents, and that's where the blessing is. And we live in a society that disobeys parents and dishonors authority, and uh, maybe two generations or a generation ago it was not so. But the blessing of God comes to children through the way that they honor their parents, and we'll go through that. So number one, understand that children are a blessing and a gift. Psalm 127, from verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And this is important, remembering what we spoke about last week and the foundation of society. Unless if the Lord is building the house, unless if we're doing it according to his design, those who build labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Verse 3, behold, children are a heritage or an inheritance or a reward from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. And it is unique that God starts with the big picture saying that he's building the house and he's watching over the city and uh, he's giving us the ability to work in a way that is productive and then we have rest. And right after that, children are brought in and we are to behold and consider and really understand 
that they are a gift and a heritage from the Lord. And many times, especially if you consider the whole abortion debate, children have been relegated to an inconvenience. Many times, out of whatever situation has happened, children coming forth, they are not to be considered as the ones to blame for coming into this world. But very much we should understand that there is raw potential, raw blessing potential that is vested inside that child from above. And then it says like arrows in the hand of a warrior. And so it begins to speak about how there is actually blessing and protection and children are, are to be weapons weapons in our societies, in our communities, against the enemy. And so when we begin to see the blessing and the value in children, we begin to see them as weapons that are entrusted to us so that we're able to raise them to the point where we are not put to shame when we are contending with the enemy. And it is a sad fact that because of the fact that many children have not been viewed as a blessing and many have not seen the potential of children to overcome evil in our societies, they have neglected children. And we must return to that value. You might be in the home today looking around and your attitudes concerning your children have been less than rejoicing because of the fact that they might need more attention than your phone. And many times, we in our lifestyles have not anymore accommodated, in our generation, have not anymore accommodated children the way that it should have been. For whatever reason, maybe we've got a great career now and so children take a back seat, or maybe we, we just started a business and children take a back seat. Even in the context of ministry, we're pushing and pushing and pushing and not realizing the blessing that our children are to us. During this time of COVID-19 and lockdown, many parents had a rude awakening and a reckoning about the fact that their children are actually their children and their children don't belong to the school. And many times when you're at home and you now have to rise up and begin to look into the homework and begin to do all the, the self-studying and all, you begin to realize how much has been delegated to teachers. And we love teachers. We're happy that the teachers are doing all of this. But teachers are not parents. They are not meant to replace the role of mom and dad. Mom and dad are the first teachers. They are the ones to guide, protect, instruct, lead, and educate the children. And if you're one of those parents that have expressed almost the point of, of, of frustration, your, your, your dismay with the fact that the children now need more of your attention, God is speaking to you in repentance. There needs to be a mindset shift. And we want, it's wonderful that we put everything in place, the schools are there. It's not to be removed at all. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we are not to, to delegate it to the point of abdication. As much as the teachers are doing their work, we should still have an eye on our children. Our hearts should still be with our children. Many times, this is even more severe in the instances where children go to boarding school. I've heard accounts of people who have gone to boarding school from grade one, from grade one. And uh, they see maybe the parents twice a year. Who is raising that child? And I'm not saying that you, you, you're not a good parent in your intention, but this is not God's way. I remember I went to boarding school in high school. I was in the hostel from grade eight through to grade 12. It was a great experience for me. It taught me to be independent at a very young, a younger age. But I still had often check-ins with my parents, a lot of letters coming through from my mom, read this scripture, do this, remember that and all. And it is important that we realize that there is a temptation in our societies to delegate and abdicate our responsibility as parents. One of the very common um, practices, especially when, when children come out of a situation where there's no marriage or uh, I need, uh, it's a teenage pregnancy or whatever, the child gets moved to grandmother and they get raised by the grandmother. And it is 
a grace that we have such parents and, 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 and family to help us raise them. But many a time, that mother, that father tends not to even think of that child until the grandmother calls and says, can you send us some money for this and that for your child? That is wrong. That is wrong. And today God is speaking to us to say, consider and understand that children are one, a blessing. Is that how you treat a blessing? Children are a gift. Is that how you treat a gift? Children are a weapon in your quiver against the enemies. Is that how you treat a weapon? And it is so important that we see the way God sees generationally. If we can shift our hearts now, we will begin to build families that not only honor God, but make an impact in our societies. Then number two, children have a purpose from God. Children have a purpose from God. I've said it many times before, this macroevolution theory of Darwin is a complete utter lie. Children don't, they don't hail from monkeys and we all evolve from the amoeba, no. We were designed by God as the crown of creation in order to steward what he's created and children are the offspring that we are to raise with that kind of accountability and stewardship. They have a purpose from God. Matthew 19 verse 13 through to 15. This is Jesus. It says here, then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them or bless them. But the disciples rebuked the parents. They rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as this. This is amazing. This is God in the flesh making his own pronouncements to parents and to community and to society that the, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. This is the eye that we should have towards our children. As we are raising them and as we are encouraging them and feeding them and nurturing them, that the, they, they belong to the kingdom of God. Verse 15, when he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. So Jesus took time from his busy, world-changing, life-transforming ministry to bless children and to correct people concerning their perspective. That God has a purpose for children. In Matthew 18 verse 10, there is this comment that Jesus makes that many might not have seen. And it is important that we note this because it speaks about the angelic in relation to children. I'm reading from the easy to read version since we're talking about children, and it says this, this is Jesus speaking. Be careful. Don't think these little children are not important. I tell you that these children have angels in heaven, and those angels are always with my Father in heaven. Another version says they are ever before the throne of God. They are ever reporting and receiving instruction concerning the children that are assigned to them. This is amazing. This means that there is an agenda from heaven concerning every child. And this is why we don't believe in this whole abortion, murdering of children, child sacrifice drive that's going on around the world. Why? Because God has ordained them for life and blessing, and he has even assigned angelic support for that mission. And parents are to recognize that, collaborate with heaven in order to bring the purpose in the life of the children to come to pass. Now, it's important that we realize that when we look at our child as they're growing up, and many of you might not have a child of your own, but you've got your nieces and nephews and, and, and children of, of your friends and, and family, and you're able to notice these things. There are a couple of things that children seem to be uniquely suited for, and this is something that we should continuously encourage in children. The first one is faith. Faith. It's like children are uniquely suited for believing. 
I remember about a year or two ago, that was when I started explaining to my children that Santa Claus is actually not a real person. And the, the person who brings the gifts is mommy. <laughs> and in, in, when we have Christmas celebration, that's, that's the person. And the same with, with the little boy who, who lost his tooth and mommy used to put money under, under the pillow and say to him, the tooth fairy brought it. And we had to correct them now and say, no, that's, that's not actually true. We say that to you guys just for the fun of it. But actually, mommy and dad give that money to you. Children have an ability to believe the unbelievable. And this is amazing. They point us, in a sense, to the way that we should be in relation to the kingdom of God. The second thing that children are uniquely suited for is humility and innocence. Children inherently have this humility from the time that they're born. And if that is nurtured, they can continue to have that throughout their life. And they're born with a sense of innocence. And this is why it is so, so evil that people are trying to pervert the minds of children, whether it be in the area of sexuality or whether it be that boys are not girls and all of that nonsense. It is so important that we realize that there's an onslaught against the, the, the humility and the innocence that is in children. Despite the fact that they're born in sin because of Adam's sin, there is an innocence from the time of, of birth that is in children. I'm reading from Matthew 18, verse 1 to 7, and this is Jesus speaking. It says, at the time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is the greatest? Verse 2, he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Amazing. Amazing. It points to the value that Jesus, who represents God and is God in the flesh, places on children. Their humility, their value. Heaven looks at children and says, wow, these belong to God. Another thing that children are very suited to is truth. Many of you parents have tried to relay, uh, 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 let's say, a white lie or some kind of misrepresentation through your children. Or you've told them, look, we don't have money. And the child will say, oh, oh, there's someone begging on the street. And they just saw you having money over there. And then when you say, sorry, uh, we don't have money right now, the child will break out and say, oh, we have money. <laughs> and you, you eventually may be forced to give that homeless person something because the child just blurted it out, you know. <laughs> or you might be having a nap and, and somebody came to visit at home and the children are there and you tell them, look, I'm going to sleep. If anyone comes, just tell them that he's not here. And then when the person knocks at the door or calls on the phone, the child will say, daddy said or mommy said, that they are not here. And they betray the lie because of the innocence and the truth that they lean to. This is wonderful. And this is something that we should learn from. Another thing, children is a suited or made for love. First John 3 verse 1, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. This is amazing. That God makes that comparison to say that the fact that you are called children points to God's love over you. And in our relationship with God, we are his children. Even Jesus, when he was ministering, he would say, you being evil know how to do wonderful things for your children. How much more will the heavenly father not do X, Y, Z for his and so children, they're made for love. In that home where they grow up, they should be loved. They should be loved. They should be protected. They should be cared for. And they have a capacity to love back. Even sometimes after you discipline a the child, they'll come back and hug you and embrace you. They have this capacity. 
as God's purpose and design in their life. Then the next thing, children are made for praise and for worship. Many times it's amazing when children are playing on their own, if you've taught them uh, songs uh, of the Lord, how they will sing those songs from their hearts, you know. Matthew 21, verse 15, Jesus has just gone through the temple, whipping out the money changers and throwing around the tables after he came in his procession into Jerusalem. And this is where we pick up the story. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple because people then came and he started healing them. The children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. They were upset. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise or perfected praise or ordained praise? This is a quotation from Psalm chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 2. Out of the mouth of infants, out of the innocent heart, praises and worship to God. And it should be from a young age that children should be celebrating Jesus and worshiping Jesus. So children have a purpose from God. They're not just, they're not just monkeys that came out from evolution. They are, they are uniquely designed for a purpose. And you'll notice that every single person has a very unique fingerprint. No one is like the other, even among twins. The DNA is distinct because every single per person, every single child has a purpose. Then number three, child abuse starts with family abuse. What do I mean by this? I mean that if we abuse the, the ordained design of family and the ordinance of God concerning family, then child abuse is inevitable. And we've said before, Miles Monroe used to say that the reason why there's abuse is because there's a lack of understanding of purpose. Without an understanding of purpose, abuse is inevitable. And so when we begin to violate what is family, if it's not between a man and a woman, now you have two men or two women who are supposed to be mom and dad in that home, or three, three parents, four, or whatever it is, whatever perversions we want to introduce. When we begin to introduce Abuses to the design of God's order, immediately child abuse begins to take place. And you might say, no, but the child is smiling and happy. You are robbing the child of the experience that they should be having concerning being raised in a home ordained according to God's principles. Matthew 18 verse 6. Here we will see that God is grieved when children are abused or even aborted. It says, if, if anyone, from verse 6, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. Woe to the person who pushes for the abortion of children. Woe to the person who votes for the abortion of children. Woe to the person who is pushing for propaganda to disrupt and affect the destiny of children. These are the words of the one who will judge the living and the dead at the end of the age, Jesus Christ. And so some of the abuses that we've seen is, first of all, at the point of birth, abortion. Abuse, complete abuse to the point of termination. It's death. And God hates the death of the innocent. Another thing that we've seen that is becoming very prevalent, and this is the excuse that many parents give. They have an, a, a, a disagreement between them as spouses, and it is unresolvable, and so it leads to divorce. And then they say it's better for us to divorce for the sake of the children. No, it would be better for you to resolve your issues and to humble yourselves for the sake of the children. The statistics are clear that children tend to take the blame when parents split up. 
They might, you might say, no, it's not your fault, honey. It's not your fault. It's you know, daddy and I or mommy and I are having a disagreement. So, so you visit daddy on these weekends and you'll visit mommy and why? And you begin to try and explain to this innocent mind a corruption that is all based on our disobedience from God's word. And you say, no, but God endorses divorce. No, he doesn't. Malachi chapter 2 verse 16 says, God hates divorce. He says, I hate divorce and violence committed by divorce against your, the, the wife of your youth or the spouse of your youth. There's, and, and you might say, yeah, but what about violence in the home? You know, what if the husband or the wife is a violent person or they lost their mind or, or something, some health concern that doesn't allow the family to continue? In those instances, you implement something called separation of bed and table, and you might have to be in a different home. If there is actual violence, we will propose that the, the spouse who is violent or who is committing that crime be arrested and be put in prison, and they'll be under a situation where they can begin to be restored, and the spouse will visit them there with the children. Today we are going to visit mommy or visit daddy in prison. This is marriage. Marriage is not just in good times and in bad times. You are one now. Whatever happens to the one affects the other. This is marriage. And for the sake of protection of the home, of course, we employ that separation. But this is the standard of God's word. What else has an abusive effect on children? Sin and sinful habits in the family. And many times we obviously know that there's the original sin, children born into sin and the, the, the sin that Adam committed. But then there are family sins that, if not dealt with, affect children and go throughout the generations. And they become what you can call generational vices, generational sins, or generational curses of family sins. Where people say, oh, that family, they are drunkards, or that family, they are promiscuous, or that family, this and that, or that family, they are abusive. And these are all because the parents have ordained an order that the children have observed and followed. And this is abusive to the children. No, children should, no child should have to experience a home full of sinful lifestyles that are then injected into their lifestyle that they continue to promote. And it is a grace that many times two, two children, even twins, are born in a home where the father is an alcoholic. The one becomes an alcoholic and the other one decides, no way, I'm out. But it's, it's just the grace of God. And we must understand that as we're building homes, we're not just talking about, yeah, there's abuse out there and, and pedophile rings and all sorts of, of, of children are being trafficked. What about in the home? What are the things that we are doing as families that are promoting the destruction of the destiny of children? And then there are curses. And I call this curses because we say, no, I'm just speaking strongly to the child. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And moms and dads have the most powerful words concerning their children. Do not curse your children. What does it mean to curse? It means to speak negatively against your child. Let me be more specific. Something like, ah, you will never amount to anything. Ah, you are stupid. Why don't you, why don't you act, be like your brother? Why are you being so stupid? And all? Don't speak that over your children. Rather correct them and say, don't do this and that. Don't do this and that. Rather do this and that. Show them the way. Correct them. But don't curse them. And many times a parent, a mom, a dad has spoken something. Like, yeah, you will never get married. Oh, yeah, when you will, all those words, restrain your tongue. And if you are two parents in the home, mom and dad is there, keep one another in check and say, oh, hold on, hold on, let's just take some time out. It is important that you help each other because sometimes parenting can be hectic <laughs> and you just lost it there at the table and you wanted to begin to pronounce curses from the mountain on this vile generation. And it is important that you realize that those words become life or death in the destiny of your child. Ten years down the line, they're struggling to have relationships, whether with the opposite. And, and one thing I must mention, if you are having marriage issues, don't talk to your children 
and say, you know, mommy and daddy are going through a situation because daddy doesn't listen or whatever. Daddy doesn't, you know, and you are poisoning the child. You know, men, men, you need to be careful, my daughter. And you begin to poison the child or, or the son. My son, mm, women are just, they, they, they are ununderstood. You can't understand. And the child begins to glean from those curses. Stop it today for the sake of those children. And then the biggest one, which we might not see as abuse, is neglect. Neglect. Children need a few basic things. One, they need food, air, basic needs, physical needs. Then they need attention. Love for children is attention. Don't just send money. They need your attention. If you're not present as a parent, they don't feel, they don't experience your love. Then children need education. They need it. If they don't get an education, they will not learn how to navigate through life. And it, that neglect is an abuse. And so mom and dad many times will do things to send children to places of education, but they need to learn it also from you. I remember with me and my sisters, our parents made such a hectic sacrifice and focus and emphasis on getting an education. In one generation, you can change the prospects of the entire family in one generation just because of what they've learned at that point. I remember my mom even emphasizing when it comes to musical instruments and learning, and today God is using all of that. It is important that you value that. Then children need discipline. Discipline. Today, it's unpopular to smack your kids. Soon, they'll even make it illegal. In South Africa, I think they've already made uh, corporal punishment illegal. In Namibia, it's not here yet. And I've heard some parents saying, we will go on holiday to Namibia. And once we cross the border, <laughs> you will get your beating in Namibia and then go back. And this is important because discipline is not evil. The word of God says that if you do not correct your child, you hate him. This is what Proverbs says. If you love your child, you will correct your child. Correct them. Don't let anything slide. Obviously, as a parent, we want to be like, you know, I'm the, I'm the friendly dad, you know, I'm, I'm cool with the kids. They love me and all of that. You are not called to be your child's friend first. You are called to be their mother and their father first. After that, you can be their friend later down the line. When they're married and have, you can play a friendship role. But while the children are in your home, you are mom and dad. You are the source, you are the nurturers, and you are the ones who, who discipline the child. Correction is protection. If you don't correct your children, you are neglecting to protect them. And I'm telling you, the world is full of evil. And nowadays, it's coming in the cell phones, it's coming through the TV, every opportunity. Sometimes you try to raise your child right and they'll pick it up at school or whatever. It is important that you continuously discipline. I'm not talking about abusing your child. I'm not talking about beating your child with some kind of object that causes them to have bruises over their body. No. I'm talking about a smack or a strong word of correction that gives them that line to say yes. And it is very important that you do this while they are small. I remember when my eldest son started going into the age of seven or eight, he began to realize the looks in his eyes after I would speak reprimand too strongly. And I realized that my time is almost up and I needed to do, do my proper discipline between the ages of one, two, three, four, five, six, and then over there you begin to now speak more, engage them more uh, mentally because you've laid that, fo that foundation <laughs> there. And some parents will say, ah, I cannot beat my child and all of that. The word of God says that folly is locked up in the heart of a child and the rod will drive it out. It says if you beat him with the rod, he will not die. He will not die. And he will grow up understanding what you have imparted to him. And then the fifth thing children need, they need spiritual input. They need devotion. They need time where the family is in the word daily as much as possible. They need to be laid hands on, you know, every day. Lay hands, not just lay hands when you are disciplining 
lay hands on speaking blessings. You are a blessing. You are going to prosper. You are going to be strong and healthy. Lay hands on them. They need to be led to Christ. They need to be baptized and they need to be blessed. So these are some of the things that please, as parents, as families, if these are missing in the home, you are busy with child abuse in one form or another. And we can all just repent because many of us have neglected these and God is speaking to us today. Then number four, in conclusion, children should obey their parents. That's where the blessing is. And we as parents have to teach our children that that's their primary spiritual responsibility. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Number two, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Colossians 3 verse 19 It says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Then verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. You have to teach your children to obey their parents. You have to instill that value when they are speaking wrongly to mom or to dad. You have to say to them, my son, don't speak like that. My daughter, don't speak like that. My daughter, you must Remember that you, you're, you're my child. You must obey mommy and daddy. It's for your protection. It's for your honor. It's for your growth. It's for your blessing. If they don't hear that from you, don't expect them to hear it from, from this rebellious generation. Then, verse 21, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. This is something that I just want to emphasize here. It is possible to discourage and to uh, provoke your children to anger and discouragement through your discipline. You don't have to be an overbearing parent. You have to be present. You have to be interested. You have to be kind. When you correct them, don't overdo it. Don't provoke them to the point where you are pushing your children away. But don't, because of that, hold back. It comes from a compassionate heart. And I want to encourage you, especially fathers, please make sure that in the home, there is an, an environment, an atmosphere where correction is, is normal, where discipline is normal. So, oh, someone is going to die today. No, discipline and correction is love. It's normal. It's honor unto God and the children. Amen. So all these principles, as we come to the end of the series, is really to encourage us to return to the foundations of society. We're going into some evil days in the future. And this is to encourage us that the center of our society is in the home. And the center of the home is the relationship between mom and dad. And then the center of that, or the, the overflow of that, is that the children grow up in a home where they are cared for. So if God has been speaking to you over the past two weeks, it is important that you respond by repentance and saying, you, Lord, I've, I've heard the word, I've heard your correction, and act on it. It is, it is in acting out what Christ is leading that you build your, your house on the rock, that you, in, that you begin to partake of the blessing that is in the instruction. And then I want to encourage us to be vocal for godly marriage and family. Don't stand back when people are saying, no, uh, children don't need to be uh, um, disciplined and don't need to be... Uh, you must speak up with gentleness and kindness, but speak for what is right and just. Speak for marriage. Stand for godly marriage. And in marriage, spouses, husband and wife, turn to one another in unity. In unity. Fight this unity. The enemy is the author of this unity. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, sacrifice yourself for your wives. And the children will grow up under that cloud. A house divided against itself cannot stand. But a house that stands on the word of God endures forever. And the blessing of these principles is to be taught from one generation to the next generation 
and to the next generation, and so it goes. And we'll build a mighty nation if we build on these foundations. So I'm gonna pray for families today before we go into a time of communion. And I pray right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, every home that's listening, I pray, God, that you'll give them grace for repentance, that they will come in a place of godly sorrow that leads to life and refreshing. I pray right now your blessing to work in every family listening to my words right now. Holy Spirit, that you'll fulfill your plan and purpose concerning their lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And so we're going to take some time right now just to break bread. I want to encourage you to do it. If you're with your family, call, call everyone together. Have the bread together and the, and, the, and the juice. I'm reading here from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. It says, For I received from the Lord, the Apostle Paul speaking, but I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he took bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take time now to partake of the bread. Share that in your home and let's partake of that right now. Father, we thank you for the bread, which is the body of Christ, broken for us. I pray anyone that's sick in need of healing, that they'll receive their healing right now, that this broken bread will restore broken homes and broken families. In Jesus' name, amen. And then I'm reading verse 25. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood or the new testament in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me so as we're doing this we are reminded of jesus we're reminded of his sacrifice we're reminded mostly of his love verse 26 for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes why do we proclaim his death we are saying that Jesus took my place in death so that I can receive life. Let's right now partake of the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. If you've got any guilt, anything that's bothering you in your conscience, repent of that right now and partake of forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that it is finished, that on the cross you did the work that was needed to reconcile us to the Father and to bring us into eternal life. Today we remember your sacrifice, Lord. We remember what you have done for mankind and for us, Lord. And we are stirred in our hearts. I pray a special blessing today over families, Lord, that will continue to glean and to harvest the riches of your blessing from your sacrifice in the body and the blood of Christ. And I thank you, Lord, that will continue to be a light in the darkness in these times. We honor you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. So thank you once again for joining us. It's been a wonderful, wonderful time in sharing these uh, messages. I want to encourage you next week to um, join us. We've got a guest speaker that's going to share with us. It's going to be a fantastic time next weekend with leaders and just speaking about what God is going to do in our nation. And so may God bless you. Continue to subscribe and join us on all the various platforms and join our prayer meetings and just engage until we meet again. May the Lord be with you. Thank you for listening. For more information about this podcast and other resources, please visit envintook.org.